So um, good morning or good afternoon for everybody, depending where you are. So welcome to one more edition of the mentoring program of the Brazilian Academy of Science. Today is the last mentoring of this year, and uh, we will close it with a golden key. <laughs> and the mentoring program was created in order to promote the enhancement of the young affiliate members of the Brazilian Academy of Science. So in these uh, mentoring programs, we try always to invite, uh, to invite repeated scientists to share the experience and to bring here about opportunities for funding and collaborations. So today, uh, the topic will be funding and opportunities for collaboration in United States and the United Kingdom. And we will have here the participation of uh, Luis Loureiro. Uh, he is executive director of Fulbright Brazil. And uh, Ryan Ahmed, uh, he is senior manager of international grants from the Royal Society for almost 10 years. So it's a great pleasure to us to have you, you here. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, to, to talk today here about uh, some opportunities. And uh, so I give the word first to, to Luis Loureiro to present about uh, Fulbright Brazil. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, um, I, I was asking uh, Jacqueline, what kind, what's, what exactly is the audience? Uh, what do you mean by young fellows of the Brazilian Academy of Science? I got a pretty much understood. Hopefully the presentation will address your main say questions. Okay, so I prepared a couple of slides that I want to, to present to you. I promise to be as brief as possible. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that most of you like me are a little bit some tired of of Zoom conferences and watching these uh, slides, but so I'll be very brief. So what's Fulbright? Fulbright, it's a program that is 75 years old. It's a program that uh, is devoted to uh, uh, mutual, promote mutual understanding between the US and other countries. For this reason, uh, it sits in the State Department that means it stays at the diplomacy branch of the US government. And you can see by this quote of the guy that created the program, the Senator J. William Fulbright, 75 years ago, as the aftermath, in the aftermath of the World War II, uh, go. Okay? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not 100%, uh, say, uh, the, the main target is not science. The target is mutual understanding, whatever that can be. But it can happen through exchanges and happening through exchanges is in all fields, all fields you can imagine. So we can get into the data. So I, I think it's still, uh, it can be still useful for you guys um, uh, uh, that are looking for an opportunity for, uh, for um, exchange or for doing uh, studies um, in the US. So um, I have a very a brief, don't be scared, a very brief video, okay, uh, that about the 75th anniversary, but it will give you a little bit of idea what kind of grant, uh, grantees we have, okay? So um, hopefully you can hear. Uh, usually videos doesn't work that well on Zoom, but still it's brief, only three minutes, okay? So um, I'll go for it. I am Pedro Lau, a Fulbrighter here in San Diego. From the University of New Mexico. From the University of Kentucky. The University of Nebraska Lincoln. From Lincoln, Texas. The Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello, 
Hello, I'm Doug Conniff, Chargé de Affairs of the U.S. Mission in Brazil, and it's my great pleasure to join you in celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program. Here in Brazil, we've been proud to support the work of the Fulbright Commission for over 64 years to provide both Brazilian and American students with opportunities to carry out advanced studies in the best universities. We do this because we know that connecting our researchers and scholars builds new bridges of cooperation and makes our society safer and more prosperous. Just looking at the list of prominent Fulbright program alumni shows just how successful we have been. It includes former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, respected anthropologist Dr. Ruth Cardoso, the first female Supreme Court Justice Ellen Gracie, and the first Afro-Brazilian Supreme Court Justice Joaquin Barbosa. And as we look to the future, our recent and current grantees are making significant contributions to innovation through their research and academic work in fields that range from cutting-edge digital technologies to the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. I want to congratulate the Fulbright Commission, the Brazilian government, and all our partners for helping make the Fulbright program one of the most successful and distinguished <laughs> And happy 75th anniversary, Fulbright. May you continue to strengthen the U.S.-Brazil partnership and partnerships across the globe for decades to come. Thank you. There is this kind of instant connection and support. So I really feel part of a family. So for me, Fulbright is excellent and fun and fun to be together. I am Oops. I am uh, oh, okay. I'm back. So uh, as, uh, as, as I guess you could see uh, uh, through the, the, the uh, grantees you have, the alumni you have, the program uh, is dedicated to all fields, but it's a focus in remote mutual understanding, diversity, and establish connections. This is for, for future leaders. This is the, the main goal. So the program is built under a, a close partnership with the local governments, in the case of Brazil, of course, with the Brazilian government, particularly with CAPES that has been in the, in the, uh, participating in, in, uh, in, in the governance of the, of, of, the, of the Fulbright Commission since its inception in Brazil in 1957. Uh, it started with uh, Anísio Teixeira in 1957. So we have partnerships with um, many different entities, uh, universities, and this, uh, sorry, uh, this uh, allow us, uh, has been allowing us to do interesting things. So I'll go through uh, quickly through uh, these uh, aspects that I mentioned before. We started in 1957, we have a board is a binational board. So um, things that we do are decided st strategically uh, uh, on this board. So a board there is, you have representatives of both uh, uh, governments, uh, diplomats from the US embassy in Brasilia, Brazilian uh, officials from uh, Minister of Education, copies that means, and uh, Itamaraty the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. And other people that are nominated, uh, people from the civil society, uh, academics, business persons, uh, you name it. Diversity, as I mentioned, it's key in all, all across the board in our, in our, uh, in our, in, in our day by day uh, lives. So finally, as I mentioned, we have regular funding from the US government that covers Brazilians going to the US and our admin costs, the local costs, and 
the money that comes from the Brazilian government is, is earmarked uh, for, to bring uh, US um, uh, grantees. Because you can't forget, it's a bilateral program. So we go here, also because it's, a, say, it's in, in the diplomatic world, uh, we look for balance in all aspects you can imagine. So that means that we try to keep balanced the number of, of Brazilians we send to the US as the number of Americans that we bring to Brazil. So this is under the Fulbright umbrella and we have what we call the broader mandate, other programs that are not under Fulbright, but they are also very important and they comply with our mission. So we have um, programs, for instance, to, to develop to modernize in, uh, education, uh, in, in higher education in Brazil. We have programs for English teachers. We have programs to promote US studies in Brazil. Many different things. So this is the structure. So it's very simple and, and, and small. The number of squares below the big red, uh, green triangle is our individuals, so we are 12, and uh, we respond to a board that also has 12 people. So we are small. So let's go to the things that were, I guess you're really interested in. So how many grants do we offer? So pretty much 100 and 110 to Brazilians to go to the US and the same number to for Braz uh, Americans to come to here. Uh, how we offer this. So they depend, uh, it depends, it, it varies uh, accordingly the, the programs that we, uh, we have. So for Brazilians to go uh, to the US, this is the, the main, your main interest here, I guess, we have PhD programs for, for what they call the full PhD. We have a very special program in, in, in in uh, my son in fine, uh, fine arts in screenwriting, a very specific program, and by the way, very successful one. Uh, we have the uh, Doctor Dissertation Research Award that we are used to, to, to name it, uh, AKA Programa de uh, Doutorado Sanduíche. We have programs for Brazilian scholars, professors, different levels, junior professors, senior professors, mid-career professors. Uh, in, in this case, we have for the, the, the senior professors, we have uh, the, the chairs. Uh, the chairs are related to specific institutions in the US. Sometimes they, they, they um, uh, are dedicated to, to specific fields. Uh, uh, I know, for instance, we have now, one now at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So this is, of course, the name says pretty much everything. So it's people, scientists interested in doing, uh, studying, uh, doing cancer research. Uh, but we also have very broad things like the, 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 our chair at Georgetown, there's a, the only full uh, hyphenated grant that we have, Fulbright Dr. Ruchi Cardozo chair in the social sciences. So it varies. It varies a lot. So you need to take a look in our website and see what we have. And we have uh, grants for uh, what we call the study and research grants for students. It's a similar for the doctor, the sandwich program for Americans to go to, to go to Brazil and say, keep the balance. We have grants for American scholars to uh, uh, come to here. So in this case, if you're interested in someone, you can also approach your colleagues in the US and tell them to apply to come to here. So this is one thing that can be inter for interest, of interest for of your interest. So, and we have language programs, language training programs is a part of our, our mandate. We send Brazilians to teach Portuguese in American universities to these instructors of Portuguese and, and, and inform about the Brazilian culture in the US at US universities. And the, the, the other way around, we receive uh, Americans, English uh, language instructors at in Brazilian universities doing the same thing that the, the Brazilians do in the US. We have uh, 
uh, teachers training program. Uh, these are small uh, programs, but still very important. Um, and uh, we have this program for professional development. I think that's not exactly of your uh, the focus here, but it's a, a kind of unique product that you have. It's a mid-career professionals that will have some academic training and some uh, practice in their own field uh, at institutions and, 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 and industries and the private sector in the US. It's a very interesting program as well. So how does it work? You guys, Brazilians that want to apply. So um, uh, our, our call for proposals, uh, most of them, I'd say 90% of them are open in, in, uh, in, uh, on, on June 1st. And so usually it's uh, open for two months. So we have the usual process. We have a technical review of applications if all the paperwork has been done correctly. And then we have a peer review and we have an interview. The interview is key in the process. And I'll explain you why. Is after going through the academic review in the third rectangle that you have here that we say we place pretty much uh, everybody at the same level say we you have re the, the, the applications that reach the fourth rectangle are are considered they have uh, complied with our uh, merit requisites and in the interview we we'll pretty much assess other aspects they are very important very uh, we are very keen on them like um, the is the person ready to have the experience is this person uh, uh, a good um, re uh, cultural ambassador? Is this person uh, will really represent uh, Brazilian society in all its diversity? So this is very important for us. So, and then we uh, go through approval of our board of directors, and then we have the final approval for the Foreign Fulbright Scholarship Board, board in Washington, DC. So that ends the process. This usually takes, um, nine months average. And uh, so if you apply uh, in early June, you can be uh, traveling, getting your to the US uh, by say beginning of August next year. It's a whole uh, year in this cycle, okay? So I will spare you of uh, how the selection uh, in the US grantee side works but it's pretty much very similar do not say identical um important to know you cannot have a, a u.s citizenship because you will not be eligible dual citizenship brazilian american will make you not eligible for the program okay so you must have a brazilian citizenship you can have another second and third but they will never can be you can never be a Brazilian uh, US citizen, okay? You must be living in Brazil during the, the whole competition uh, process. Um, why is that? Again, remember, it's a public diplomacy tool. So uh, we do want this person to be a representative of the country, not a researcher that, a Brazilian research that does, uh, that, that does uh, outstanding uh, thing, uh, research elsewhere uh, in, in the world. So this is why you want people uh, to be in Brazil. So language skills, it varies from program to program. And again, to uh, in our effort to bring as much diversity as we can to the program, we are ready to um, accept good academically speaking uh, um, candidates and invest in their English training, uh, even in the US for periods that can go up to nine months. Okay, and the last one, it's uh, it summarized pretty much everything that I said about uh, diversity. Okay, so I, this is not exactly the moment to talk about this, this is pretty much what you have to do um, I wouldn't 
I will bring your, to your attention that if ever you have been in the U.S. in the, pa the past under a J-1 visa, you have the two-year rule uh, um, applicable, and so we need to send the information about your previous stays in the U.S. So, um, and uh, this is what we do. Again, it's a little bit too, too much now to talk about uh, these aspects on how to implement the wall, the work. Uh, so this is what I have to talk to now. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And the, thank you, Jacqueline. I will stop uh, here. Thank you very much, Luis, for this very nice presentation and very important information. And now I give the word to Ryan Ahmed. So Ryan. The word is yours. So I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen now? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay, so. Uh, hello, thank you for having me today. My name is Ryan Ahmed and I'm a senior manager of international grants at the Royal Society. Um, and I'm here to talk about uh, what the Royal Society currently offers for Brazilian researchers. So today I'll be going through a bit about the uh, Royal Society and our funding portfolio, uh, specifically our international grants the application process and what, it, what we'd like to see in them. And right at the end, I have contact details should you need any further information. So this is the Royal Society. It's based in London. Um, it was established in 1660 and it has a Royal Charter, which allows the Royal Society to be independent of government. And the society is made up of, of about 1600 fellows. And this fellowship is drawn from leading scientists from around the globe. And through this fellowship, the Royal Society has established links throughout the globe. The Royal Society also has its own scientific publication. One of these scientific journals is the oldest peer-reviewed journal in existence. And we also have a policy department which helps inform on scientific policy. And we also participate in public events such as the Summer Science Exhibition to help disseminate to, uh, science to the public. And these are just a few things that the Royal Society does. The Royal Society has three strategic priorities, promoting excellence in science through its fellowship and grants, supporting international collaborations as science is inherently an international activity and has a key part in the society's work throughout history. The society aims to reinforce the importance of science to build partnerships between nations, promote international relations and science role in culture and society. And our third priority is demonstrating the importance of science to everyone. So now I'm going to talk about the schemes that the Royal Society has to offer, the first of which is the Newton International Fellowship. So the Newton International Fellowship, these are fellowships that are two years in length. They allow researchers from all over the globe who are in the early stage of their career, uh, which is what we define as the first seven years post their PhD to come to the UK to conduct their research. Part of this is that we will provide a monthly stipend, consumables and a relocation cost that also includes the cost for visas for yourself and your dependents. And one of the benefits of having this fellowship is that you'll be able to apply for a fast track global talent visa as your application would be endorsed by the Royal Society. There is one round per year and it's a much sought after scheme. We see typically about 800 applications per year and we currently open our calls for applications in January and they close in March. And in order to apply, you'll need to apply with a UK co-applicant who will host you within their research organization for the two year duration of a fellowship. And applications are made around a single scientific project. And we also offer training provided by the Royal Society for holders of this fellowship. And I should mention that the Royal Society only funds applications that are in the natural sciences and engineering. The second scheme that I have to offer is the International Exchanges Scheme. This is what we call our mobility grant scheme. 
the international exchanges brings together UK researchers and their overseas counterparts in the form of a mobility grant. Applications are again based around a single scientific project with the intent to stimulate a new collaboration between uh, th uh, through bilateral visits. Uh, in order to apply for this, you will need to apply again with a UK based scientist in order to be eligible for the scheme. And the grants are typically up to two years and up to a maximum of £12,000. And these are paid at the beginning of the award as a lump sum. Part of the funding can be used for consumables. However, majority of the funding is intended for travel and accommodation for both applicants and their groups. There are three rounds per year, so if you do miss a call, it won't be long before the next call opens, and the next call will be open in January and again will close in March. And future calls can also be found on the website. Again, this is a very popular scheme and it's shown to start collaborations between researchers, which eventually lead on to bigger and better things. So hopefully you're interested in applying for one of our international grants. Our grant process is similar to other funding bodies. It consists of an application that's made up, uh, made through our grant system called FlexiGrant. And this is online and can be found on our, on our website. Um, after it's been submitted to the Royal Society, there's an internal check for eligibility. And once it passes that, the application is then passed on to peer review. And once all the peer reviews have been collected, the applications are then discussed by the panel and a decision is made on whether you are successful or not. So what are we looking for in your application? And this can be applied to any scheme at the Royal Society. At the core of the Royal Society, we are looking for excellent scientific merit. As I mentioned, the grants are based around a single scientific project. So we want to see a valid hypothesis. We want to see novelty in your work and how creative you can be. We also want to see a proven track record. As we invest in people, we also want to see how this grant and project would help you. And we want to know if the institution involved are well placed for supporting your grant and your project. So hints for making an application to any of the schemes at the Royal Society. Please leave plenty of time. Our panel of very experienced can tell when an application is rushed. Write a good lay summary as our panel may be leaders in their field, but they're not a specific expert in yours, but would have a good general knowledge in your field and a good lay summary would allow interpretation of the work you plan to carry out. Be enthusiastic. Panels like to see applicants who are passionate about the work and this does show in the application. And finally, please read the guidance notes. A lot of work goes into creating these documents and these notes do guide you on how to complete the application. Also, you don't want to get to the end of an application to find out you might not be eligible and the eligibility criteria are in the notes. And should you ever need help uh, with eligibility or completing the application, please do contact the grants team and they, they are very much happy to help you. And finally, um, here are the contact details and the website should you need any further information just to let you know that other grants are available and that, that you may be interested and details of these can be found on the website and thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much Ryan for this very nice presentation and also to talk about uh, these uh, opportunities. I think it's very important to us. So now we have a time for questions and comments. So please, if you want to, you can write in the chat or you can raise your hands and we, I will give the words. So we have um, um, Patricia Garcia. So Patricia, please, you can start. Thank you, Jacqueline. Can you hear me well? Yes, we okay. can. I would like to ask for Ryan a question about the Royal Society Fellowships. And actually, in, in particular, the international exchange scheme, um, it was not clear to me if it was uh, directed to Brazilians or it was like uh, for all the countries in the world. Or it, and the other question is, do you have a scheme that is specifically for Brazilians? Um, so the international exchange is, is a global program. So the, the current offerings that the Royal Society have are all global. Um, so they're not specific at the moment for Brazil or any other country. So um, that may change in the future, but um, right now the international exchanges are a global program. So 
um, anyone in the world can apply to that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for this question. And now uh, I would like uh, taking the bridge of uh, the question of Patricia, and I have one question for both, actually. Uh, for Ryan, it's about this uh, international, um, international exchange scheme that you mentioned. Uh, is there any limit time uh, for uh, to apply like some age? And in that case, if not, I would like to know that if the researchers who are selected are most seniors or young, and if there is some imbalance on this. And also, uh, I have one question to Louise in the same direction, because I saw in the Fulbright there are several callings, and there is one that's for researchers and professors in Brazil, that they have more than seven years after finishing their PhD. So I'd like to know if the researchers who are selected are most seniors or young, or if there is any balance on this. So I don't know who wants to answer uh, first. Let, let me start, let, we just heard from Ryan, so can be, okay. if you don't mind Ryan. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, so. The 70 years after the PG is the limit to, to characterize our, the, the applicant as a senior or a junior uh, um, scholar. So if you have more than seven years, you will apply for the, or what they call the all disciplines. If you are a junior faculty, less than seven years after your PhD, uh, you uh, apply to the to the junior um, junior scholar award. So, uh, how many we have? They they quite I'd say quite balanced. Um, we uh, last year for this uh, forty grants we had uh, three hundred and eighty three three oh, close to 40, 400, uh, 390 candidates and uh, most and we have 170 candidates for the junior program for the 20 grants of the junior program and the remaining and, and 100 and uh, almost 200, 200 and plus to the the senior this includes the chairs of course because the chairs the chairs are the chairs okay but still it doesn't mean it's not related to the age, it's related to the time that you have after your PhD. It doesn't, it, that it's possible, perfectly possible to have a person in, the, in their 30s, uh, early 40s, applying to a chair. That, that happened, that happens. It depends on, you know, on the, in the area, it depends on many things. So um, we are very flexible. We want as many candidates as we can, so we are only, the only um, um, requisite that we do is this number of years after the PG. Hopefully, uh, I have responded to your question. Actually, uh, I have just uh, before Ryan answered, I have only uh, to specify a little more the question. For example, in this, that's more for uh, more than seven years. And so it could be may, many researchers, uh, even like the mid career and also very senior. And my, my question is about uh, the most applicants or the most succeed uh, applicants are the seniors one or maybe this mid career, like uh, 15 years after the PhD you, or it you depends, mean, you mean, there is a balance. If you mean the number of candidates that you have, because the number of slots are pretty much the same. So we have 20 for the regular for the junior program. And there we have 170 candidates. Okay. Mm -hmm. This year. Okay. I'm talking numbers of this year. So 170 candidates that have uh, that that show it up, submitted their applications, and had less than seven years after their PhDs. This is the one group. And the other group the 20 plus the close to 10 chairs that you have total of 30, we have 230 senior mid-career people applying. There, there is no limit. This is what characterize someone as a senior or uh, uh, mid-career, uh, it's very fluid. Well, we, it's, we, it's uh, because for chairs, we expect a solid, uh, a solid uh, curriculum 
and most of the times this happens with people that are very uh, say above their 50s sometimes 60s but it happened to have people with a very very solid curriculum at the age of 40. it depends on the area it depends who is applying so okay okay thank you thank you very much ryan so um, for the international exchanges, it's the calls are open to all career levels, so early to mid to senior career. Um, in terms of what we see going through to funding um, or to be successful, it's a, it's a mix. We don't have one over another. Um, the concentration on terms of the what is deemed more fundable is the scientific merit. And that can be demonstrated at all career stages. Um, but what we tend to find in terms of the early career people that are getting funded, these are people who have just started off their journey as an independent researcher. So that's kind of like the minimum threshold all the way up to the senior. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to know um, from both of you about the, the competition. Um, for example, how many applicants do you have uh, in? each of them, for example, Newton uh, funding, like uh, what's the percentage that uh, the, the, that goes to the final part? For example, uh, Luis mentioned about the interview that has in Fulbright. So how many per percentage of uh, the applicants arrives in this stage of uh, the interview? And uh, for uh, Ryan, I would like to know how many applicants uh, per year you have in each one of these two, the international is, is exchange scheme and in the Newton Fund. Okay, let me start uh, just to keep this idea of uh, alternating <laughs> the <laughs> responders. So um, the, our goal is to have at least uh two uh interviews per slot so this is the, the number we interviewed at least two candidates for one award this is the the, the usual number for the the sandwich uh, the ddra and the um the program of in in language of, of language but you are not interested in for the scholars we don't have interviews we just select on on based exclusively on on what the only the, you know, on the application so again what we do most of the times is what happens we have uh, such a number of good candidates that we only take those that were ranked excellent by the reviewers and we make a mix of of areas to have because uh, we we Ideally, we want to have uh, at least one, one uh, person receiving awards for all different fields that um, uh, we, we can find in the pool of candidates, okay? This is, we, we want diversity in all possible aspects, gender, race, race um, you name it. And this includes uh, where this person is coming from, Brazil, uh, and um, and also um, the fields of knowledge. Okay, mm -hmm. so but the rule for the programs that we have interview is to have at least two persons for one slot, with the exception of the MFA in fine arts, because this one is so competitive, so competitive that we have usually a hundred candidates for two awards and uh, the goal there we we need to read all plots it's crazy work but at the end we have at least that in this case we have usually eight to ten persons to be interviewed for two slots thank you um, okay thank you so uh, ryan um, so I think I mentioned before in the Newton International Fellowships, we get um, probably a little less over the last two years, but we typically get about 800 applications. And again, this is in all disciplines of science. So everything from maths, physics, biology, chemistry, engineering. Um, so we get a total of about 800 applications uh, or more. Um, for the international exchanges, 
as there's more rounds per year, um, we are looking at roughly the same sort of numbers um, for a global program and again in all of the scientific areas. So we get about roughly the same numbers, about 800 applications total. Uh, but for international exchanges, we are looking at about a 30% success rate in terms of what we are currently funding at this point in time. I, okay. May I clarify one thing, uh, Jacqueline? Mm -hmm, Jacqueline? Sure. It's sure. Jacqueline or Jacqueline. Um, uh, it's, it's important to know that uh, we, when you apply uh, for a uh, Fulbright in Brazil, you are competing with, you, with your fellow citizens only. So mm -hmm. there is, uh, it's, it's not, we have programs that is a global competition. But this is not the case of most of the programs I mentioned to you, like the Scholars Program, the, sand, the Sandwich Program. Um, the, the professional, the, the Humphrey Program is one that you have a global competition. But it, there are just a handful of them. All of, most of the programs that we have are in uh, the, the are, are um, say, only for Brazilians to come and Americans to come to here. Okay, great, thank you. We have some uh, questions here in the chat. So I will start with uh, the first question that's from Giordano Ponet. Giordano including is here. If he wants, he can um, also say, uh, I will read it, but uh, good morning, afternoon to everybody. Thanks for the very useful presentations. I have a question about the Fulbright Initiative. Do we need, a United States professor to be previously in contact with before applying? I mean, someone that would accept the Brazilian professor in his or her lab. Thank you very much. So it's to Okay, okay uh, Giordano, yes. Uh, the, the, the way the program is now is you do need to have a, a letter of invitation from a professor, someone, a, a colleague, uh, your counterpart in the US if you are a professor. What happens is that if ever you are interested and you can't identify this person for any reason, we can try to help you to find what would be the some person that can help you uh, if ever you need this kind of, of uh, support. Not because we have access to privilege information because we, we you have all Saival, uh, um, Scopus, all this, this uh, databases that, or Google scholars that can help you on that. But uh, sometimes we have uh, alumni, our alumni, uh, Fulbrighters in, in, in the US and there are more than a hundred thousand um, that are always eager to uh, receive uh, other full buyers. So this is how we can help. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. Actually, uh, I think this question can be also extended by to Ryan. So Ryan also, uh, is that possible someone apply to one of these fundings from Royal Society without having uh, any uh, previous contact with some research or lab there? Uh, previous, no, yeah, so you can you can do that uh, with the Newton International Fellowships. We have seen um, applicants who are very successful literally reach out to a professor in the UK and say, I would like to apply for this uh, fellowship. Would you would you be willing to host me in your lab? And that's as simple as that. That's that's literally what people have done and have. Um, being successful off the back of that. Um, similarly, though, there are people who do know a specific person in that field that they have been in contact with, but it doesn't put you, it doesn't put you above the other. We, as I mentioned in the presentation, part of the criteria is also to look at the institution to see if that institution would work for you. It is, it is part of that um, scoring criteria, I should say. So, um, prior contact is not a must it's it's i guess it would help you but it, it's not for not for us but uh with the international exchanges um the premise of that is that the scheme itself is there to start brand new collaboration so you may have met somebody in passing but know of their work and you want to start a collaboration with them that's the perfect scheme for you um 
but um, prior contact again is not necessary is if you are both willing to collaborate together that's probably the main important thing about it okay thank you very much also here we have a question from leticia palares also uh, i think Leticia is also here also if you um after she wants to complement something, uh, she brings a very important uh, concern here. Um, good morning, afternoon. Thanks for very useful information. I would like to know from both whether uh, there are any special criteria when considering maternity impacts on candidates. Thank you in advance. So I think it's very important. And also uh, together with uh, her question, I would like to know, for example, if uh, there are some uh, thing that happens during uh, the period of the fellowship. So there are some uh, possibility for extension, for example, if uh, there are some uh, um, maternity in that period. So it, it would be possible to extend the fellowship. So I would like to complement bring these other questions together. So please, maybe Luis can start <laughs> to do that. Oh. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Leticia, for and, and Jacqueline for your question. Uh, what we we have we don't have anything we'll say formalized in this way. What we do, we we are as as flexible as we can. So it happened. The case is that uh, the candidate um, is uh, become is pregnant o over the the selection process and can and must postpone. The departure for for this reason so this we can always accommodate this is not an issue uh what and even people that want to to uh, travel uh, pregnant that, that also happens uh extensions this kind of uh, of uh, say uh, special uh, or a maternity leave uh we don't have it. Sadly, we don't have it. Uh, just to let you know, even the, the, you, you, I'm sure you're aware of in the US, there is no maternity leave. So it's unbelievable, but this is what it is. So even civil servants don't have a maternity leave. And uh, things are so between the, the employer and the employees. So that being said, there is what we can we can provide is as much flexibility as possible to accommodate specific need, uh, needs, but um, that usually uh, does not imply that we will have additional funding for this uh, situation. What we should, by the way, and uh, my opinion, can be limited because, for instance, we have a special funded for people with special needs, uh, so. And we, we look for people with, we, we like in under this uh, diversity mandate, we like to have grantees that with the special needs, but sadly, this is not the case for um, uh, young mother or mothers with uh, toddlers or, or uh, pregnant women. Okay, thanks, Luis and Ryan. Um, I'll talk about this in two parts. So the first one is um, when applying for something like the Newton International Fellowship, uh, one of the eligibility criteria is that we consider a early career researcher, somebody within the first seven years post PhD. So if you had parental leave, so it's maternity, paternity, adoptive leave, uh, during that seven years that pushes you outside that boundary, we take that into account. So you won't be penalized for it. So we would deduct that from your total time. And if that makes you eligible, it makes you eligible. Um, so we, and it's not just, it's not just at paternity, um, paternity leave or maternity leave or parental leave. It is also for caring responsibilities. So if you had a career break during that time, uh, for whatever reason, we will also take that into account. Uh, so we try to be again, as flexible as possible. Um, during your fellowship, if uh, if you be, if uh, you need parental leave, um, we we accommodate that. Um, it's usually in line with the with the host university's policy, um, and all of this can be found on our website as well for our exact policy. But we will pay you for that time as well, uh, but in line with with your host organization's policy. Okay, thanks. Um, can I just can I just also add for the for both 
the international exchanges and the Newton International Fellowships. Um, we again try to be as flexible as possible, so we do offer uh, extensions, no cost extensions as well. So if there are any hiccups or for whatever reason sick leave as well, we also offer extensions on that. But we all, uh, we do have a sick leave uh, policy, and we uh, we have offered no cost extensions just to make sure your project is completed. Oh, that's great. Uh, but um, only to mention that I saw here uh, one comment from Leticia. Uh, I think also she would like to know uh, specifically in the moment of the evaluation, uh, for example, if you see the CV uh, and uh, there is some moment that uh, the person had the this um, break in the mater maternity, if in the CV it is taken account that maybe in that uh, period the person was not so productive. So if it is taken account or not in the evaluation process, I think if I understood correctly, maybe Leticia can tell me if it is. It's, it's, it's taken into the account that it's understood that there would be um, nothing produced during that period. So it's, it, it is not a mark against you, if that yeah. makes sense. The same, the same thing here. It's the, it, Mm -hmm. Maternity is part of life, so uh, honest, this will be taken into consideration with the tools that you have in hand, but still, it's, it will never, say, jeopardize the, the application or the candidate. It's, a, it, it's not in, in any way taken into account during the evaluation process. It's, it's the individual, not the condition that we are assessing. So. Okay. Okay, th thanks for, for the answers. And uh, uh, I have another question um, concerning uh, when the applicants uh, submit some proposal for both, uh, for Fulbright and Royal Society, and if uh, uh, it's not succeeded, uh, they receive it, some reports, how they can like change it was, which points were in uh, unsatisfactory, only to know how to rebuild that, that and uh, resend it. Okay, if I, if I may start, uh, yes, uh, you, it, it depends. If the person requests this, we can send them. Only in this case, if we have the, if, if the, if the candidate um, uh, wants to see uh, what were, how was the evaluation, yes, we, we can provide this. Oh, nice. <laughs> Um, probably not so simple from the Royal Society side. Um, due to resourcing, it's it's uh, with with the amount of applications we get, um, it's quite hard to give individual feedback. Um, sadly, one of the things that uh, that has been coming up year upon year is that there's a very very fine line between who can be successful and who is not, um, and it's really hard to even give additional pointers on those on those applications. Mm -hmm. But I should say that if you are unsuccessful, we, we don't, if you're still eligible to apply, we would never turn you away. So you, you can still keep applying. Yeah, um, if I can compliment um, Jacqueline, um, mm -hmm. as I said, we, uh, we have this interview phase when we don't accept merit anymore. So what we can provide is the merit, the part of the assessment. And the merit, it happens many times, it's very good but we have a small number of awards and we are looking for uh, uh, the diversity in all aspects. And we say, okay, you have a wonderful, a wonderful um, uh, application, but we have another wonderful candidate with the same characteristics, but we could uh, better fulfill our diversity uh, mandate with the other person. So it can be somehow frustrating because we uh, have, uh, overload of very, very good uh, candidates. And every year it's becoming worse and worse because we have fewer opportunities and we have better candidates. So you guys are making our job uh, very difficult, <laughs> but it's, 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 um, it's still a, a, a good thing if you look into, in the, into the big picture, but still um, it's, uh, I'd say we, we, we uh, can provide this information uh, of the uh, merit part, but it can be somehow, say, uh, pointless for the purpose of uh, developing a, better, a more competitive application because conditions are very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Only to let to know uh, if there are other questions in the audience, please uh, can write in the chat or raise your hands. And uh, another question that I think it's uh, concerning for this moment that you are living now, uh, because I think many people can have some uh, doubts about applications because of pandemics, the, all the situations. So I'd like to know about the flexibility. For example, uh, the person is planning to go next year and would like to apply, but uh, maybe because of the situation of uh, pandemics, uh, is that some possibility for extension of the period or I don't know, some flexibility from your side and also concerning about the visa. For example, now I think it's more complicated to get the visa, to, to, to change, to travel because of all the restrictions that change um, sometimes. So I'd like to know also if, uh, uh, if the person has uh, succeeded with the application, if you help the person to get the visa and the, to enter in the... I know that maybe Ryan mentioned a little about that. It is easier to get the visa, but I would like to know about considering now the pandemics, this scenario that uh, gets worse and all these difficulties that come together with that. I'm not sure if I was clear with the question. Um, can I go first? Um, so in terms of the pandemic, we have seen um, a lot of these fellowships start a lot later than we expected. Um, these are considered on a case by case scenario. Um, and a lot of the information can already be found on our website and how we are dealing with that. But in terms of the last year, we've seen people remotely start their fellowship for about two to three months um, before they could actually make it to the UK. With the visa process, um, personally, I, I'm not 100% sure about it in terms of what the actual input is. But from what I understand is that the applicants will fill out the application form, it's sent to the Royal Society for endorsement and we endorse it. And that's very much a, an easy process. Um, but it's a, it's more the issues that we see coming up is more about the timing of when to arrive in the UK has been more of an issue, but that's more of a um, an availability of flights because of the pandemic. Um, but we, we try to be as flexible as possible. We, we've, we've taken on every single case looked at them individually and agreed to majority of them. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, okay, so hopefully we went through the worst part of uh, the pandemic, hopefully. Um, and during this very hard period uh, that we had the, the last fall, I mean fall, uh, uh, less uh, second semester 2020 okay um, like ryan uh, grantees from uh, royal society we have many people that started made one one semester one one term the first term online because it was not because simply because the the institutions were not open period so the, there was no reason for them to go to the US because the institutions were closed. They were 100% online. As they start uh, moving to slowly to the hybrid, uh, introducing in-person components and, and move to a hybrid mode, uh, it was possible to get them a visa under what we call the, the national interest exception because they are Fulbrighter, so they could be at the very beginning. So we could send them. Uh, so it, and so to make a long story short, we sent all of our grantees over the year to the US um, early January, in, in February, they were all there. For, for those that have some level of in-person activities that can be justified. And uh, don't forget, it's a bilateral program. So there is a US government component. We have the embassy on our board. So uh, these things related to visa, uh, though it, they don't decide uh, because the consular section is a completely different um, uh, department at, at, the, at the, the embassy, there is still uh, very uh, influential in the process and they could get their their uh, visas uh, 
without any any uh, trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. What what's going to happen next with the pandemic? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. So we are being very say cautious and uh, hopefully uh, just to give you an idea we are receiving we have two cohorts of americans because they couldn't come because uh, we could not bring the, them because the state department uh, put brazil not, not the state department there was a presidential proclamation that put brazil was uh, say uh, in a kind of um, uh, blacklist together with the Schengen space and the other countries. Uh, and now in March, we will be receiving 230, a wave of 230 Americans to Brazil because it was a regular wave plus the one that was, uh, could not come last year. But it, this is something that we can't say, we do our best. <laughs> But it's, it's also related to the sanitary conditions, the health authorities. We are, we are in the back seat, like everybody else. So, uh, but we do our best to help. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> and that, now I have a, a, another question. Um, one to Raya and another to Luis. Uh, to Raya, it's about, uh, uh, because uh, as Luis mentioned about Fulbright, is in both ways, like uh, Brazilians goes to USA and also Americans comes to Brazil, if I understood correctly. And I would like to know if in the Royal Society there are also some uh, incentives for people from e UK come to Brazil to research, if there is also this other way around. And uh, uh, to Louise, I would like to know, because you mentioned that uh, this, that uh, you talked today, were about the calling from the Fulbright Brazil, specifically Brazil and uh, USA. But uh, you thought that it's also possible to apply directly to other callings to, from Fulbright. So I'd like to know uh, how that works, if there is some website that maybe Brazilians can know better about that. And if it's possible that Brazilian apply to Fulbright Brazil and also to Fulbright, like both, it's that pos possible too or not? So there are the questions. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so I mean, the international exchanges are still the, the mode that we would use to have an exchange of UK researchers going to Brazil, as well as Brazilian researchers going to the UK. Um, we have in the past have had collaborations with other, other organizations such as uh, CONFAP, um, who have provided a reciprocal program, um, programs where UK researchers can come to Brazil. Um, and I'm still where some of them are still going on, but the, those programs are generally through our partners or collaborators, I should say. Okay, okay, but so, do okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Jacqueline. Please. No, no, I only would like to know that uh, you thought that before I uh, had this type of uh, programs with CONFAPI, but uh, do they long exist or not anymore? Um, I believe one is, I think they exist as of this year. I don't know whether or not it continues. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, thanks. So, please, Luis. So, uh, Fulbright by nature is bilateral. So it's both ways. And if you are a Brazilian and you want to go to the US, you apply to the commission in Brazil and you try to get an award to go to the US. If you are an American, and it works the same, the same way in, in the US. If you're an American and you want to go to Brazil, you apply to Fulbright in the US to come to here. That means also that you can, I mean, Brazilians, we Brazilians can be proactive in this process and uh, say, invite or, 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 or convince your uh, American uh, counterparts uh, to apply for a Fulbright in Brazil. But this is done in the US. There is one, one, only, one exception there's the, uh, the Fulbright Specialist Program, but it's institutional where the institution can apply to receive an American. This is something through a very simple project 
we are working now specifically with Unbox Association that you, I'm, I'm sure some of you should be aware about, Associação Nacional de Pesquisa e Pós-Graduação em Ciências Sociais, exactly along this line. So we, we made an agreement with them. So we are collecting proposals of graduate programs in the social sciences to receive Americans specialists in the field over three years. So this is one exception. So the way to do this, send us questions. Uh, we have our email for, for respond questions. Uh, take a look in our uh, uh, website. It's also another uh, way or, or you know, Instagram and this kind of thing, you know, social media. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice, uh, all these informations. And uh, uh, just to, I don't see any other questions in the chat and also nobody raising the hands, but uh, just to finish, I would like to, to do a uh, um, final question. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, Fulbright promotes a lot of uh, like uh, videos when it's close to the the period of the applications to guide people uh, about submissions. And uh, I would like to know um, if there is something in that direction for these applications for the Royal Society, like the Newton Fundy, and also this other international uh, exchange scheme. If it's, there is there is some videos that can uh, give some tips and the talks with uh, the other ones that uh, won before these uh, types of uh, fellowships. And uh, also uh, for the Fulbright, uh, I also would like only to, to that, uh, that, that to mention that uh, uh, which period that people should uh, that these lives happens and people should be pay attention to to attend it and to know more about informations. So. so. I have just put in the chat a link to our website, which has actually a really nice video of uh, some of our Newton International Fellowship Award holders. Um, and it gives their experience. Um, I think it also tells you the reason why they would like you to apply for a Newton International Fellowship. Um, there's a lot more information on the website, including sort of the makeup of our grants for, for the international exchanges, in terms of what regions you kind of see applications come from and awards coming from. So I would recommend to, to have a look at that. Okay, thank. So um, we, um, I would suggest you to to uh, pay to to uh, subscribe our our uh, it's not a newsletter, but our contact, so you can receive uh, messages informing you about the opportunities. Um, follow the, I think, social media. It's easier. The period is now. We have the full PhD program that will be open. Uh, in January, uh, exclusively for the humanities and social sciences, because last year was exclusively for the, the, the STEM fields. And, um, and January, at June 1st, we have the regular uh, call where all, uh, most of uh, our uh, calls for applications will be open. That being said, there's always new things because we uh, try to be creative <laughs> and we make up things all the time. And I will take profit of this opportunity of talking of me talking to you that we'll be launching uh, early, say in August, I hope, a, a program, a regional program for the Amazon, uh, for the Amazon region, but it's dedicated for researchers in the Amazon region, people that work that uh, work there about the Amazon region, not people that work uh, on the Amazon river from, I don't know, from Rio or Sao Paulo. So uh, it's a regional program that will involve all countries in, in, in the Amazon basin, basin and the US, uh, US researchers. So uh, it's a, it's a, it'll be a very nice program, I hope. So uh, we'll be launching this after the Summit of the Americas in May. So pay attention. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, including here, there is a question from Philip that uh, he's, he's asking if there is any open calls 
for postdocs fellowships at this moment? Uh, is we there? don't have postdocs. We don't oh. have postdocs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult um, postdocs because we always have trouble. People don't come back. <laughs> Okay. Uh, similarly for the Royal Society, we don't we don't have calls specifically for postdocs. We have calls to transition a postdoc into something more independent, such as an inter international fellowship or the University Research Fellowship and the Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship, but not not for a postdoc, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, I think uh, it was the, the last uh, uh, question. And I would like to really thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, presentation and uh, talk about these opportunities. I think it's very important for us that uh, are young and the mid-career scientists to know more about these uh, possibilities to internationalization and to bring more collaboration to our projects. So thank you very much for these uh, very nice presentations. Uh, maybe Monica, no. Uh, well, I, I don't know, uh, she um, maybe. Okay, so I, I would like really thank you very much for, for these very nice uh, presentations. It was really good and um, to us, so thank you. And uh, also I would like to say that this is our last uh, mentoring program for this year. And I think we close it with a golden key with these two very nice uh, talks today. So thank you very much for all your attention and uh, for all the audience that were here. So thank you, uh, Louise and Ryan for your time and to contribute with uh, our mentoring program. So thank you for having me today. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Ha happy holidays for everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.